Welcome to the very first episode of Serial Streamers. So basically the genesis of this podcast episode that you're listening to now was an idea that I came up with recently to start a true crime TV club, kind of like a book club, but for people who watch all the true crime series, the documentaries, the TV series that are out there. And I suspect a lot of people listening to Murderish are also binging that true crime TV content. I know I am. So I just had this idea of, you know, I don't always get to talk to my partner or my best friend about what I just watched on this docuseries, for example. And so I thought that a true crime TV club would be a really great way to create a community, a club of people who are all like-minded people watching these true crime documentaries just like I am. And then we can take to Instagram and talk about them, right? We can share our hot takes, we can share our unpopular opinions, all those things. So this is the very first episode of our TV club that we're starting, and we are calling ourselves the Serial Streamers. And that's because we're going to be serially watching these, serial, serially binging these true crime series. And then we're going to come to Instagram, we're going to talk about it. So I'm really excited about this. But don't worry, you're still going to get all of the regular murderish episodes that you get every single Monday. It's just that now, in addition to those regular murderish episodes, every other Friday, you're going to get a serial streamers episode as well. And in that serial streamers episode, it's going to be a lot more conversational. It'll be me walking you through a true crime docuseries or TV series that we watched as part of the serial streamers club. I'll walk you through the story. I'll give you all sort of like the background, kind of like I do on Murderish, but just a lot more conversational. I'll walk you through the case and what I watched on the docuseries after the Serial Streamers podcast episode drops, either that same day or within like a day or two after the episode drops. I'm going to go to Instagram and I'm going to start a conversation thread about that docuseries that you heard on the podcast or that you watched as part of the Serial Streamers Club. And then we'll take to Instagram and we'll just talk about the case. We will share all of our unpopular opinions, our thoughts, our theories, our hot takes. It'll be just like a book club, but it'll be a TV club. And we will virtually meet on Instagram every couple of weeks and we'll talk about these cases. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun because like I said, you don't always have somebody close to you in your life who shares your love of true crime content, right? So it's not always easy to talk about what you just watched on, you know, this crazy docuseries, for example, because not everybody's really wanting to hear it because they're just not into true crime like you are. So enter the Serial Streamers Club. We're into it and we're going to talk about it. So at the end of this episode, I will tell you how you can join the Serial Streamers TV Club. And spoiler alert, it's super easy. Anybody can join. So stick around till the end and I will talk about how to join the Serial Streamers Club and how you can participate. All right, you guys, for the very first episode of Serial Streamers, I'm covering a case that is sort of a blast from my past. So if you're around my age, I'm 45. If you are around my age, Age and you kind of grew up in the 90s, you may very well know about this case. It's a wild one. And it is okay. It's the case of Mary Kay Letourneau. And that name is probably going to sound very familiar if you're around my age. If you're not familiar with this case, buckle up because I'm about to walk you through it. It's wild. It's controversial. It's going to evoke a lot of emotions. So Let's go. So the first docuseries that I watched as part of my research for this case is the Mary Kay Letourneau Notes of a Scandal on Investigation Discovery. Now, Mary Kay, or Mary, as they call her, Mary grew up in Newport Beach in Southern California. It's a beautiful beach town. I've been there numerous times. The beaches are lovely. A lot of rich people live there. The sun is always shining, it seems like. And um, she had a best friend named Michelle. They met in the 1980s, early 1980s. And Michelle is featured in the this docu-series and she talks a lot about Mary Kay. I always want to call her Mary Kay, but her name I think is Mary. But she talks a lot about hers and Mary's childhood and sort of when they lost touch at a certain point. Now, she described, Michelle described Mary as being the most beautiful girl in school. She was very popular with the boys. She had six siblings. Her parents were John and Mary Schmitz. Now, her parents were staunch Catholics. They were against contraception, no sex before marriage. Uh, they preached abstinence to their children. The mom, actually, Mary Schmitz, actually pulled Mary out of a sex ed class in school because she was adamantly opposed to it. Mary's father, John, was a senator. The premise of his campaign 
was he was the king of morality. I cannot roll my eyes any harder because you know where this is going to go. When somebody is telling you in, as part of like a presidential campaign or a sen senatorial campaign that they are the king of morality, you know this motherfucker is not the king of morality, like at all, by any stretch of the imagination. Like, you know how this is going to end. You know where this is going to go. So get ready. But anyway, he ran on the premise that he was the king of morality and he had just a beautiful, perfect family, right? Now, Mary was daddy's little girl and he called her Cake as a nickname as a kid. Now, Mary's mom, on the other hand, was described as cold, unapproachable, and showing no affection. She was matriarchal. She was a social climber and she basically fought against women's rights. I mean, she thought that women should stay home. And again, I'm rolling my eyes. Mary's best friend, Michelle, from childhood, actually went so far as to say that Mary Schmitz, the mother, didn't act like she even loved Mary at all. At 11 years old, something really traumatic happened to young Mary. Her mother left her in charge to watch her baby brother. He was a toddler at the time. His name was Philip. And he ended up drowning in the family pool. And uh, Mary's mother blamed her for his death. And the family did what so many perfect on the exterior families do. They swept it under the rug. They didn't talk about it. Anything negative just really was hush hush in this family. Don't talk about it. Sweep it under the rug and just keep things moving. And I don't know if I said this earlier, but uh, John Schmitz, uh, the father, actually did run for president later on in life. And that's when his king of morality premise kind of came to be. That was sort of what spearheaded his campaign. That's what he that's the ticket he ran on that he was the king of morality. Um, he didn't end up winning, obviously. Young Mary was considered a rebel, kind of a rule breaker. She loved, loved, loved boys. And she loved the attention that she got from young men. She was a very, very pretty girl. Blonde hair, thin, popular. I just, you know, she always had the best makeup and outfits and she was from Newport Beach. You can just picture her in your mind. And Mary was a bit of a party girl. Obviously this raged against what her family was all about. But like I said, she was a bit of a rebel and she kind of did what she wanted. In July of 1992, John G. Schmitz, her father, made headlines and not for good reasons. So he was caught in a huge scandal where he and a former student of his who he used to teach at a community college and this young woman was a former student of his. Well, Mr. Morality was caught up in a scandal with this former student and he actually fathered two children with her while he was still married. So he was obviously stepping outside of his marriage. Mr. Morality was stepping outside of his marriage. Shocker. From that point on, after that big scandal, I mean, young Mary was crushed because she was daddy's little girl. She looked up to him. This completely changed the Schmitz family dynamic. Their whole facade changed. However, uh, John and Mary did patch things up and they just kept it moving and they stayed together. In 1983, Mary was 21 years old and she started attending Arizona State University and she wanted to be a teacher. That's where she meets her first husband, Steve Letourneau. Now she meets him in college, but her friends, Mary's friends, don't think that Steve was up to Mary's level, um, intellectually or spiritually. They just didn't think they were a good match. But Mary gets pregnant by Steve, and her mother, a staunch Catholic, you know, very conservative and strict, you know, strongly urges her daughter to now marry Steve because she's with child. So Mary, Mary gets married to Steve, and the two of them move to Anchorage, Alaska. Then they move to the Seattle area, where Mary becomes a school teacher at an elementary school, and Steve Loturno is a baggage handler at the airport. They have four children children together in a very short period of time. They didn't have a lot of money. They were sort of like tag team parenting. So one of them, I think it was Steve would work at night. So Mary would have the kids at night, but then Mary would go and teach school during the day. So Steve would watch the kids during the day. So they kind of tag team, which meant that work was their lives and they never really had time to bond as a couple. They never had time together outside of taking care of the kids on their own. Now, Mary was really busy during this time. She had a very hectic life, um, but she always managed to wear very fashionable clothes, always had her hair perfectly done, and she was very well known for always wearing bright red lipstick. And I remember in the news coverage about this case, she always had that bright red lipstick on and it looked good on her. In the early 1990s, this is when Mary is a second grade teacher at Shorewood Elementary School in Burien, Washington. That is when she first meets eight-year-old Vili Fu... I'm going to say this wrong. Eight-year-old Vili Fualao. Fua Lao. 
I used to call him like Vili Falal, but I know that that's wrong. Like when I was younger and I knew about this case, that's how I always pronounced it. But I think it's Fula <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, we're just going to call him Vili. Um, that's when she first meets eight-year-old Vili, and he was her student in second grade. So she's the teacher. She's in her probably early 30s at this time. Now, Vili is from a large Samoan family. He has a single mom, Suna, who worked a lot of dead-end jobs. Um, she didn't make a lot of money, but somehow supported her kids on her own. Her ex was in prison. Vili's father was in prison, so he wasn't around. And Vili is a very artistic child. He's described, his artwork was described as dark and edgy, and he was sort of beyond his years in talent. But he had this sense of abandonment because his father wasn't around. He was sort of a lost soul with a lot of potential. Miss Letourneau, Mary Letourneau at the time, was Villy's and so many other students' favorite teacher. She was different than other teachers. She seemed to sort of like get the kids. She related to them on a level that other teachers couldn't. She would do special things in class to help them learn. She brought a kitten into the class to be sort of like a, a class pet. And she really took to students who were struggling and wanted to mentor them and help them. Now, Vili was an at-risk child and Mary wanted to mentor him and he flourished under her mentorship. Meanwhile, Mary and her husband, Steve Letourneau, are fighting over money. They lived beyond their means. Uh, they were really not a united front as a couple. And Mary's disdain for her husband, Steve, just continues to grow. Now, in 1995, Mary's father is dying of cancer. She adored her father. And Steve, her husband, really wasn't there for her during that time. Mary began to sort of go down and start spiraling when her father was dying. Also in 1995, this is when Billy starts the sixth grade. He's 12 years old at this time. And he again has Miss Letourneau, Mary Letourneau, as his teacher. And he's elated. During this time, Billy's hormones are just raging. And at one point, Ms. Letourneau has to confiscate a porn magazine from Billy because he's curious. Also during this time, Mary Letourneau has never been unhappier in her marriage to Steve. At a certain point during this time when Billy's in sixth grade, um, Mary Letourneau is 35, Billy's 12. The two of them start to write notes to each other and they start to list attributes about each other that they liked in one another. They would say things like, you're smart, you're beautiful, and their intimacy starts growing. Billy would later admit in court that he had a huge crush on Mrs. Letourneau at this time. Also during this time, Mary starts taking Billy on trips to art galleries in her van. She starts to become more and more obsessed with her student, and Billy is spending more and more time at the Letourneau house, and he's very integrated with Steve and Mary Letourneau's children. He's there all the time. As gross as, as it is to say, the sexual tension between these two, a 35-year-old teacher and her 12-year-old student, really starts to grow. And people describe Billy as being around the block, an old soul, not like other boys. They're saying that he's like a lot more mature for his age, a lot more experienced than other boys his age. Now, it was discovered later that Billy at one point had written on his computer, and, I'm, and I quote, I am going to rape my teacher. I'm going to kiss her from head to toe. This is obviously very disturbing language, but also remember this is a 12-year-old boy. He would later say in court as sort of like his excuse for writing that was he thought that meant that he would have wild sex with his teacher. So as far as like the rape verbiage, I don't know if he truly knew the meaning of that, but it's it's very disturbing nonetheless. Now in May of 1996, this is when things really take a turn for the worse. Billy and his teacher, Ms. Letourneau, are in her car together. They're having dessert. This is when they kiss for the first time and the affair officially begins with a 35-year-old teacher and a 12-year-old student. And while Steve Letourneau is working the night shift, Billy will come over to the Letourneau house having an affair with Mary while the kids are sleeping. Now, on one particular night, things escalate between the two of them. Apparently, Billy wanted to have sex with Miss Letourneau. She declined, but she did give him oral sex, which she later admitted. From there, the rumors and the gossip begins. There's this forbidden affair, and Billy is talking to people about it. Again, he's a 12-year-old boy, so you can imagine he's going to go tell his friends and brag to people what's going on. And the rumors just start to swirl about this 
very inappropriate affair. In June of 1996, about a month after the affair really got started, um, it was in the evening and there was a security officer at a marina who spots a van and he thinks what he thinks is a drunk person inside. So he goes to investigate, but first he calls the police. When the police get there, they look inside the van only to find Mary Kay Letourneau in the back of the van with a makeshift bed and Villy is with her. So you can just imagine what they were doing. So the police call Villy's mom, Suna. She thinks everything's okay. So she's like, no, that's his mentor. That's his teacher. Just leave my son with Mary. Everything's fine. She doesn't suspect a thing. So the police leave Villy with Mary. The affair only heats up at that point. And in July of 1996, Mary confesses to her best friend, Michelle, that she has fallen in love with a student. Now, her best friend figured it was an older high school student, not a 12-year-old boy who's in sixth grade. At this point, Villy's only a year older than Mary's oldest son, and they would have sex while Steve was at work and while the kids were in bed. It was just completely inappropriate. Villy was constantly crashing at the Letourneau house, and like I said earlier, he was very integrated with the Letourneau children, kind of part of the family. At some point pretty early on, Steve Letourneau finds love letters, which were written by Mary to Villy, and then some were written by Villy and sent to Mary. He's livid. He feels betrayed. He goes to Villy's house and he confronts the young boy. And Villy spills the beans. He completely admits the affair. Steve says he wanted to make things work with Mary, and he thought maybe she would come to her senses after this point, but Mary didn't. She was no longer in love with Steve. She was in love with Villy. And the students in Mary's class around this time, they noticed that something was off about her, that she was distracted. She wasn't her normal self, but they didn't know what was going on. On February 25th of 1997, that's when a family member of Steve Letourneau's contacts police and they report the inappropriate affair. Police talk to Villy. Once again, he admits the affair, and Mary Kay Letourneau is removed from the school grounds and arrested for rape of a child. Everybody in town is absolutely shocked at this news. But the real bombshell was yet to come. Mary Kay Letourneau was pregnant, and guess who the father was? Her 12-year-old student, Villy. He was 13 years old by this time. So she's pregnant with Villy's child. He's 13. In March of 1997, this is when Mary gets an attorney, and as she should, because she's in hot water. He tells her that he's got some really bad news for her. She says, but he wanted to do it. That's her quote, basically saying like, but Villy wanted to do this. He's in love with me, as if it, that makes it okay. And the attorney informs her that due to the age difference, this is a serious crime. And she's then charged with two counts of child rape. While she's pregnant with her victim's child, essentially. Wild. Now, at, the, at this time, Villy's mother, Suna, she trusted Mary with her son, and she's absolutely shocked and devastated. Around this time, the news media picks up the story, and it is just like the perfect story for the media to just blow up because it is just such a controversial, wild, outlandish scandal. Not to mention she's a good-looking woman. It just had all the makings of huge headlines. So this is about the time when I started hearing about this story. It was in the news constantly. And I remember seeing Mary Kay Letourneau visibly pregnant in court. Now, she was known for wearing these very innocent looking like baby doll dresses. She had this blonde, naturally curly like ringlet hair. So she was very attractive and she always had that bright red signature lipstick on in court. And Mary just says over and over again, but we're in love. And she didn't really grasp the legal issue. It's like, yes, we know, lady, that you're in love, but you're in love with a boy who was 12 when you started the affair with him. She just thought she romanticized the whole thing. She just thought we're in love. He wants this. This is mutual. I mean, people were really looking down on Mary Kay Letourneau at this time. Neighbors were disgusted with her. And a lot of them called out the double standard, right? Because they're like, if this were a man, nobody would want to publicize the story in a way that they do with Mary Kay Letourneau, an attractive blonde school teacher, right? So they're sort of like, it's okay to sort of 
blow it up in a way that's like, oh my gosh, look at this. Like it's not that big of a deal because it's a woman. But if it was a man, I mean, everybody would be absolutely disgusted and horrified and maybe it would make the news, but it also wouldn't be like a sexy story. It would just be a very dark and creepy and gross story. Mary's best friend in the docuseries claims that Mary had previously told her that Steve Letourneau was getting physical with her around this time uh, when she was caught having the affair. The police were actually called to their home at one point on a report of physical abuse while she was pregnant with Villy's child. Steve, at this time, he leaves the home once he everybody finds out she's pregnant. Steve Letourneau leaves and he takes their four children with him. On May 29th of 1997, Mary Kay Letourneau gives birth to a baby girl named Audrey. This is Villy's child while she's on parole. And at this time, she's alone in the family home. She is not allowed to see Villy. There's a no contact order. The home is going into foreclosure. She's in financial ruin. The house was an absolute wreck. And all she could keep talking about is Villy and that she wanted to see Villy. She was really spiraling in a mental decline during this time. She was very disconnected from reality. She was hurting her four children at this time and her husband, but she didn't really realize it or acknowledge it. Her court proceedings were delayed so she could give birth and um, but the court does eventually find Mary Kay Letourneau guilty on two counts of rape in the second degree. She's labeled a sex offender. She has to register as a sex offender and at the same time she did draw some sympathy from people during this time and again it's that double standard. If this was a man who was having an inappropriate affair with his 12-year-old student, a female or even a boy, that just it wouldn't be treated the same way. There would be no sympathy for him. So there really was a double standard going on here. Now, Mary Kay Letourneau was facing over seven years in prison unless her attorney could be successful in getting her qualified for SOSA, which stands for Special Sex Offender Sentencing Alternative, which if he got her approved for that, it could keep her out of prison. As I was talking about earlier, you know, Mary Kay Letourneau really romanticized this relationship, which actually is very common among sex offenders. She did end up getting approved for the SOSA program, which meant that she didn't have to immediately do prison time. She would get a delayed sentencing, but if she didn't meet all the SOSA guidelines and all the judge's orders during that time, she would immediately be remanded, you know, sent to prison for an over seven year prison sentence. So she gets approved uh, under SOSA. She immediately starts as part of the guidelines. She starts meeting with a state mandated therapist. And this therapist says that Mary Kay Letourneau actually told her that she was sexually abused at the age of seven or eight years old by a family member. Mary Kay Letourneau also apparently told her best friend Michelle back in the day that she had been abused by a family member. So I do believe, I do believe her claims that she was sexually abused as a child. I have no reason to believe that she's lying about this. Now, just all these things coupled you know, grouped together that were going on with Mary Kay Letourneau. You know, she had a lack of love from her own mother. She had the death of her little brother under her watch, which her mother definitely blamed her for. She was severely disappointed by her father, who was caught up in that horrible scandal with his former student. She experienced sexual abuse as a child, and she was in a very loveless marriage, potentially a physically violent marriage, although I have not been able to substantiate that claim. You know, this all may have added to Mary Kay Letourneau's evolving personality. Um, nobody ever paid attention to her, so she developed narcissism, maybe, in theory. And it was really all about Mary at that point, and she had no regard for anybody else, not her kids, not her family, not her husband, nobody. It was all about her and her needs and her wants at this time. Now in court, before the judge sentenced Mary Kay Letourneau, she gave the judge in a tearful plea that she, she gave her the, her word that she would absolutely never do this again and that she would have no contact with Villy. She gave her her word. So the judge did approve her under SOSA and that's when she started, Mary Kay Letourneau started to see the state mandated therapist. Now the requirements under being qualified under SOSA were, were that 
Mary Kay Letourneau had to register as a sex offender. She had to meet with a therapist twice weekly for a minimum of three years. And the defense during this time had presented an expert to speak to Mary Kay Letourneau's bipolar disorder. And a lot of people thought the defense kind of made this up so that she could get approved under SOSA because I think the defense attorney argued, well, this, you know, this expert is saying that she's or diagnosing her as bipolar. So clearly that was one of the reasons she behaved in this way. We need to get her treatment, not prison time. So the judge does approve her for SOSA and that her bipolar disorder, as the defense presented it, had a, a lot to do with that. Now, she was also sentenced to six months in county detention center plus treatment, like I talked about earlier. But the treatment provider made it clear from day one, uh, the treatment provider tells Mary Kay Letourneau, just like all the other men in my program, you're not going to see your kids for six months. So basically, she was not allowed to have any contact with minors during this time because she's just been convicted on two counts of child rape. So just like any other man entering that treatment program, she's going to be treated no different. So she wasn't allowed to see her children during this time. Her defense attorney reassured her that this is only temporary. We've got to get through this. You will see your kids again. Now, the Sosa treatment provider who treated Mary Kay Letourneau said about her that as a large majority of other sex offenders do, Mary did not see herself as a sex offender. She was simply in love, um, according to her. And the therapist saw this as grooming, right? She saw Mary as exhibiting typical sex offender behavior. She was grooming Villy, and eventually they fell into a relationship. This treatment provider also said that she thought Mary was charming and manipulative, um, what she, she said that what Mary said and what Mary did was not the same. She was always really late for all of her appointments. Um, she made a mockery of the treatment program and the treatment specialist didn't think that Mary had any intentions of not seeing Villy, her victim. Again, uh, she just thought that she was just going here, going through the motions because the state mandated her to do so, but she didn't see herself as needing treatment, as being a sex offender, and she was definitely bound and determined to see Billy again, no matter what she told the judge and no matter what the judge told her. And sure enough, in February, on February 3rd of 1998, a patrol officer who was out on a suspicious vehicle report sees a vehicle and the windows are completely fogged up and he looks inside and he finds Mary Kay Letourneau in a baggy t-shirt with Billy likely having sex in the back of the car. So, of course, this is a huge violation of her parole. This is exactly what she told the judge she wouldn't do, and yet she just went right around, right away, and did it. And she's with caught with her victim in her car um, having sex. Now, at that time, Mary Kay Letourneau tried to talk her way out of it, but the police were like, yeah, no, we're very well aware of your case and you're not going anywhere. But in her possession at that time in the car, this is interesting, she had $6,000 in cash. She had her passport and some baby clothes, which pointed toward her and Villy possibly leaving the country with their baby. So within weeks, Mary had violated the judge's orders and she was immediately sentenced to 89 months in prison, which I think equates to about seven and a half years. Um, Mary Kay Letourneau is absolutely sobbing at this news. I don't know why she's surprised. Um, and this marked the end of her friendship with her best friend, Michelle. Michelle said she never spoke with her again after that point. In February of 1998, Mary Kay Letourneau arrives at Washington Correction Center for Women. And at that time, she was asked to do a urinalysis, which she refused. And in fact, Mary Kay Letourneau would refuse a lot of things that the prison officials would want her to do. She was very defiant in her first her beginning time in prison. And lo and behold, she's pregnant again. So she didn't want to do that urinalysis, I guess, for a reason, um, not just being stubborn. It, they find out in prison that Mary is pregnant again at 36 years old with Billy's child. So clearly, at the time when she was on parole and ordered not to see her victim, she got pregnant by her victim. In October of 1998, Mary gives birth to the second baby girl, who's Billy's child, and the baby, just like the first baby, immediately goes to the custody of Suna, who is Billy's mother. And the inmates during this time say that Mary, you know, in prison didn't think the rules applied to her. 
Uh, and so at one point, she was pumping breast milk um, for her brand new baby in prison. She would pump the breast milk and then she would smuggle items out to Villy. And the way that she would do it was she would hide little notes inside the the top of the nipple, I guess. She would fasten the nipple onto the bottle and somehow she would hide notes in there and Villy would get them. And of course, this was against all the rules, but she was a rule breaker, right? And at one point during the docuseries, um, Mary Kay Letourneau's defense attorney, who is very, very invested in her case, he's very clearly developed a bond with Mary Kay Letourneau. He says that at one point while she was in prison, he saw scratches on both of her wrists and that Mary had considered suicide during this time. And Villy said in an interview during this time that he was depressed during Mary's time in prison. But a lot of people said that he was robbed of his childhood. Clearly, he didn't see it that way at the time. He was in love with Mary Kay Letourneau, but a lot of people are like, she robbed you of your childhood. You just were too young and inexperienced to realize it. Now, while Mary is in prison, her father does end up passing away. And at this point, it's sort of a turning point. She starts to behave in prison and become a model prisoner, so much so that, you know, she would read to the blind at a local college. She would tutor prisoners. She started a choir. She helped prisoners with legal research, and she worked on her own appeal during this time as well. During this time, Mary got a new attorney, and she was actually successful in some of her filings. So she prevailed in getting an order not to see her kids without a third person present lifted. So there used to be an order that a third person had to be present while she was able to see her kids. She got that order lifted with her new attorney. And she was also successful in getting an order lifted that previously banned her from profiting from the sex scandal with Billy. So that's interesting. On August 4th of 2004, Mary is released from prison. And by this time, Billy's 21 years old. And Billy convinces a judge to lift the lifetime no contact order. And so the judge agrees. And so now Mary Kay Letourneau and Billy can see each other. And they can even get married if they choose to. And that's exactly what they did. On May 20th of 2005, Mary marries Billy. And uh, they sold the exclusive rights to Entertainment Tonight for $1 million. So E.T. got to be at their wedding and take all the footage and publish the photos. And they were paid a million dollars for this. And again, it's a double standard because, again, if this was a man who later marries his young student bride or however you want to describe it, I just don't know if it would be romanticized in this way or that he would be paid a million dollars for us all to watch this damn wedding. So really, really a double standard here. Maybe Mary wanted to marry Villy not only because she was in love, but also so that she could prove to people that this really was true love and nothing more. It was just true, authentic love between two people who happened to have a huge age gap and who happened to be one of them uh, 12 years old when the affair started. Anyway, some people still thought that Mary Kay Letourneau was a pedophile and others thought over time, okay, maybe this was true love and they start to accept the relationship. In 2011, Villy and Mary are interviewed by Meredith Vieira and at this time, Mary's 48 years old and Billy's 27 years old. And when Meredith Vieira asked them, so what do you guys have in common? They both kind of looked up into the air and like they couldn't really give an answer as to what they had in common. It was very clear that they didn't really have a lot in common. Now, in his adulthood, Billy went on to become a DJ. And one of his gigs was on Tuesday nights and they would call it Hot for Teacher Night. And of course, his teacher bride would show up at the gigs and like just kind of like ham it up and that would get more people to his DJ gigs um it's just it's so interesting they they continued to make money off of the scandal basically and interestingly Mary's four older children um two boys and two girls they attended her wedding to Billy so there was a time when Steve Letourneau sort of took them out of Mary's life because of what was going on and she just really wasn't in a good place and she was doing all these things with Billy. He took the kids and so she wasn't really close to them during that time. However, they did come back at some point and they did attend her wedding. And in fact, shortly after the wedding, I think a couple of the kids or if not all of them moved in with Billy and Mary. So they were back in her life at that time. Now, as far as Mary and Billy's marriage was concerned, a lot of people 
said that they didn't act like a typical husband and wife. They described Vili always being in another room with his friends, listening to music and getting high, while Mary just did like store runs, like, hey, you guys need anything? And she would like bake cookies for them and sort of acted like a mom would act, like a like a cool mom would act who wants to be a part of her kids, you know, lives and wants to be that cool mom who's like their friend instead of their mom. Only she's his wife during this time. At some point, though, Villy and Mary's relationship becomes pretty rocky. And Villy, at 33 years old, uh, files for separation. He then withdraws the separation, but later on he does go through with it. So they do get divorced. I watched another docuseries besides the one I told you guys at the top of the episode, and it was called Mary Kay Letourneau Autobiography. And this was on A&E. And basically this is a little over 20 years after the scandal broke. And it's all about Mary Kay Letourneau sort of reliving the story in her own words and how she feels about it now. Now, 20 years later, I found this interesting, but Mary still had a hard time calling what she did a crime. Uh, you can tell she's still trying to detach herself from being a sex offender and committing a crime 20 plus years later. She claims in this documentary that it, so this is semantics right here, but Mary Kay uh, or Mary claims that it was never a student teacher relationship because her claim is that Villy wasn't her student at the time, which is just semantics. Whether he was her student at the time or not, he was a 12 year old boy who you began an affair with when you were 34, 35 years old. So she's still detaching herself from it. She's still sort of like splitting hairs and trying to make it seem like it was kind of okay. She also says in this documentary that um, she's not sorry that he's the father of her children. And Mary describes Villy as being a child who repeated kindergarten. So he was actually older than the other kids in the class. Again, she's justifying her acts. And I don't even want to say to her credit, but to her credit, I think Villy was 12 going on 13 when the affair started. But like, who gives a shit? It's the same damn thing. You know, at 12, 13 years old, your brain is not even close to being fully formed. And you are absolutely a child. Uh, you are not equipped to make these lifelong decisions or to be engaging sexually with an adult. Like it just, it's all kinds of wrong, but she's still justifying it, you know, to this day or back in 2020, or I think it was 2018 when this documentary came out. Now, Mary says at one point in the documentary that Villy was always looking at her in class. And she says it really was not on her part as far as like pushing the relationship. Essentially, she's putting the blame on him as like, he's the aggressor, right? And again, my argument to that would be, listen, he may have been the one who had a crush on you. And maybe he made comments to you. But that's not it. It is your job as the adult with the fully formed brain to back him off right away and let him know this is absolutely not okay. But she didn't do that. So but she's essentially blaming him and saying that he was sort of the aggressor in the relationship, which is complete bullshit. But she does say that, you know, Billy would tell her, you know, look at her and basically he would make it obvious that he liked her. And she said to him, can you hold that for a long time? Meaning love, meaning like it was a way for her to tell him like, hey, I like you too in that way. But can you hold on to those feelings until this is appropriate? Now, Mary admits later that she knew it was risky to spend so much time with Billy, but she trusted herself not to cross the line. And now I thought this was interesting. So the a lot of people would consider Mary Kay Letourneau a pedophile. Um, the definition of a pedophile in short is that it's someone who has a propensity to have relations with children over and over again. Now, some said Mary didn't meet that definition because she the over and over again part, right? So they say maybe, yes, she's a sex offender, but she's not a pedophile. I don't know. I feel like it's splitting hairs and no, she wasn't someone who had relationships or a propensity to have relationships with children over and over again. But she certainly did pursue this one child over and over again, knowing that it was wrong, knowing that she had previously told herself in her mind, like, hey, don't cross the line, trust yourself, even though she was having inappropriate feelings. So I don't know, I think I can go so far as to say she was a pedophile, but some don't believe that. Now, before Mary and Billy got married, their wedding plans were leaked to the press because Mary went on and she did a bridal registry at Macy's and that got leaked to the press. So 
what ended up happening, which is absolutely crazy, was that strangers saw this story in the media and saw that these two were getting married and that she had a registry. They went on and bought every single gift on that goddamn registry. So again, if this was a man marrying his female younger student later in life, do you think that they would be celebrated? Do you think that people would go and buy them all these wedding gifts? I just, I don't know. I don't see it, but I don't know. After they got married, though, they couldn't take a honeymoon um, out of the state because Mary was still on parole. I thought this was interesting as well. So Mary is a very bright person, right? She was a teacher and in prison, she got a lot of practice um, helping prisoners with their legal cases and doing legal research and certainly doing her own legal research for her own appeals, which she was successful in some of them. So she actually went on to become a paralegal and she had a lot of practice, you know, for that in prison, as I said. So kind of an interesting path to take, you know, given what she was accused of. It's interesting because I always wonder, you know, she was a paralegal and she was helping people and I have no doubt that she was probably really good at her job. But knowing what she had done, you wonder if some people would not want her to work on their case. But obviously, you know, people were able to set that aside later in life. And as the scandal died down, and they were still in love in adulthood, I think a lot of people just came to accept this relationship that was once highly inappropriate. In this docuseries, Mary starts talking about more recent cases of female teachers having relationships with their students. But she says, you know, after my case, you knew it was against the law. At least in my case, I didn't know. And again, she's making excuses. She's like, you know, at these more recent cases of female teachers, you know, having relationships uh, with their student, younger students, you know, at least they know now based on my case. But, you know, we just didn't know back then or I didn't know back then. It's just a crock of bullshit. And again, she's just 20 plus years later, she is really distancing herself from being a criminal. She just wants it to be, hey, we were in love. It was consensual. And we didn't really know any better back then. Bullshit. She knew better. On July 6th of 2020, things take a, a real turn for the worse for Mary Kay Letourneau. She actually dies from stage four colon cancer, um, and she was 58 years old at the time. So that is essentially where her story ends. Although they were divorced, Billy uh, was with Mary until the end, and he was heartbroken by her death. As far as Vili and the kids and where they are now, as of September of 2021, according to In Touch, Vili was arrested on DUI charges, although those charges were later dropped. He might still live in the Seattle area as of 2020, and he was working as a DJ. In a 2020 interview with Dr. Oz, Vili said, as far as when he was asked um, if he found himself attracted to a child in the same way Letourneau was with him, what would he do? And he said, uh, I would probably go and seek some help. He says, I couldn't look at a 13-year-old and be attracted to that because it's not in my brain. He added, it's nothing that I'm attracted to. I mean, we all have our preferences, and that's just not something I would go towards. So it's just an interesting, you know, take because obviously he was in an inappropriate relationship with his teacher, um, but he was the victim in this. And he sees now as an adult that that is inappropriate, and that's not something he would be attracted to, so... Interesting. Um, as far as Mary's older kids, um, her four older children, the two daughters and the two sons from Steve Letourneau, they would now be in their late 20s and 30s. And as far as her two daughters with Villy, they would be in their early to mid 20s at this point. And that is the case of the forbidden love affair between a 35 year old teacher, Mary Kay Letourneau, and her 12 year old student, Vili Fulao. It's a wild case. I just, this is really a blast from the past. I remember this just hitting the media like wildfire. And anybody who's close to my age is probably gonna know this case. Now, I obviously have a lot of opinions and emotions about this case, and I am bursting to get those opinions out. Um, but I'm gonna hold back only out of fairness for the Serial Streamers TV Club because. I promised that at right after this episode drops, so if you're listening to this episode now, 
take a look at your phone or whatever you're listening to this podcast on. Look at the date that this episode dropped because on that date or shortly thereafter, I'm going to go to Instagram and I'm going to put a post out and it's going to be about this case and it's basically going to be a conversation thread for the Serial Streamers Club to weigh in on this case because by now they should have all watched the documentary. I announced the TV club assignment about a week, week and a half ago that we would be watching these Mary Kay Letourneau documentaries. But even if you haven't watched them, you're, you're feel free to weigh in. But yeah, as the day of this recording, either the same day or the day after, I'm going to put an Instagram post out and it's going to be a conversation thread for all of us serial streamers to give our thoughts, our theories, our opinions, our unpopular opinions, our hot takes, anything you want to say about this case, you can weigh in. So if you're not following me yet on Instagram, that is where the Serial Streamers Club is going to meet um, every couple of weeks to talk about these docu-series that we're watching as part of the club. So if you're not following me on Instagram, please do so so you can join in on the fun. I'm at Jamie on air. That's J-A-M-I on air on Instagram. The one thing I will say is, like I said, I'm going to hold back on my opinions so I can wait till we get to Instagram and share them there. But the one thing I will say is I think it's very obvious in my tone. I don't support this relationship. And I think that Mary Kay Letourneau bullshitted herself and tried to bullshit the rest of us by sort of like distancing herself from being a criminal and being a sex offender. She sort of distanced herself and romanticized the relationship, which I can't wait to unleash how I'm feeling about this case. I am a mom and I have a son. And so I just have a lot to say. So I cannot wait to meet you guys on Instagram and talk about this. All right. So like I said at the top of this episode, the whole genesis for this podcast episode that you're listening to right now was cr created from an idea that I had to start a true crime TV club, which we are calling Serial Streamers. So if you're into true crime documentaries and TV series like I am, and I suspect that you are, and you want to join the Serial Streamers Club all you have to do is follow me on Instagram. I'm at Jamie on air. That's J-A-M-I on air on Instagram. So every couple of weeks, I'm going to go on Instagram and I'll announce the next true crime TV series that we're going to watch as part of the Serial Streamers Club. So basically, that's your assignment. So once I announce that, you'll have about a week, maybe a little longer to watch whatever TV series, whatever TV series that I'm putting out as the assignment. And then after that, I am going to drop an episode, which like the one you're hearing now, on the Murderish feed. So, but it'll be titled like Serial Streamers or something like that. I will drop an episode on the podcast. And on that same day that I drop an episode or shortly thereafter, I'll go back to Instagram at Jamie on Air and I will create a post so that we can talk about that TV series assignment and we can share all of our opinions and our hot takes. Um, basically, that is our meeting place. So like book clubs get together at somebody's house. Well, the Serial Streamers TV Club, we get, to, we get together on Instagram. And essentially, that cycle is going to repeat every two weeks. So I will make an announcement on Instagram. I will follow that up about a week later with a podcast episode about the docuseries or TV series. Then I will drop an Instagram post so that we can talk about the series um, and then repeat. All right. So that's how it's going to work. I hope you guys will join the club. I think this is going to be so much fun. And again, all you have to do to be part of the club, there is no special handshake. There is no other requirement other than just to follow me on Instagram at Jamie on air. Thanks so much for joining me on this very first episode of Serial Streamers talking about the case of Mary Kay Letourneau. I am really looking forward to chatting with all of you about this wild case on Instagram. I have a lot to say, but I am trying to zip my lip for now so that I can save it for the Instagram post. Um, and I cannot wait to hear what you guys think about this one. All right, I'm going to say it one more time. Make sure you're following me on Instagram at Jamie on air. That's J-A-M-I on air. That way you can follow along. You can weigh in on these cases. Um, and you can also suggest cases or documentaries for us to watch. So Serial streamers, whoever's part of this club, feel free to go on Instagram in these conversation threads. And I want to hear your suggestions for the next true crime docuseries or TV series that we should watch as part of the Serial Streamers Club because I am totally open to suggestions and I want to make this sort of a community thing and I don't want it to be always me giving you guys your assignment saying, okay, 
we're going to watch this. I want it to be based on your guys' feedback as well. All right, you guys, I'll see you back here in a couple of weeks for a brand new Serial Streamers podcast episode where I'll walk you through another wild true crime docuseries or TV series. Bye for now. Creep on in, on in, on in.